Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number 15 of the Small Town Pastors blog. Uh, as, as Nate and I were just talking as we're getting ready, we haven't fallen off of the face of the earth. Um, <laughs> it may seem that way, uh, but uh, one, of the, one of the things in ministry is that it is very easy to become very busy uh, and very bogged down in what's going on. And you have other things just kind of slip off of the radar or have to be set on the back burner for a little bit while you do the things that are more pressing. And unfortunately, uh, that has happened to the two of us over the last few months. Um, but we do definitely want to continue this series of conversations with you and with one another on um, just things that come up in ministry, in church life, as just Christians in general. Uh, if you are new to this series, uh, this uh, small Town Plasters vlog began as a conversation between Nate, who is the pastor of the Buchanan Christian Church in Buchanan, Michigan, uh, and myself, Keith, uh, I'm the pastor of the Cave City Christian Church in Cave City, Kentucky, uh, as a way to discuss some of the uh, pluses and minuses, the, the good things and the bad things that come about when you are pastoring in a, a smaller church or in a smaller community. Uh, so much of the material that is out there to help people in ministry is uh, aimed at larger settings. Uh, I remember one of the books that I read that was supposed to be for smaller churches was, well, if your church only has 150 people, then you can do this. But normally you have a thousand. Most of us aren't in that normal. Um, and so, you know, what does it look like? to do life and ministry in a smaller setting, which is where the vast majority of us really are. Uh, and so that's what uh, this whole entire series is about. We've spent a lot of time in previous episodes talking about church leadership, um, not just as pastors, but also as elders, as deacons, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and today we're going to kind of branch out a little bit and talk about uh, Bible study and how to use that in ministry and in your daily life. Uh, so Nate, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, it's good to be with you again, Keith, and uh, I've always enjoyed these conversations, and you're right, sometimes we just get so busy with life and ministry that even connecting for an hour or so a couple times a month becomes difficult, uh, but we're, we are back at it to talk about good Bible study habits for ministry leaders, and you know, what Keith and I have in mind for this conversation is, of course, uh, for pastors, right, but also for elders, deacons, small group leaders, Sunday school teachers, right, people who are uh, ministry leaders in one capacity or another, or another. And what does it look like to have good Bible study habits? Every Christian, every Christian needs good Bible study habits, right? But uh, there is an additional level of uh, responsibility uh, for those who are ministry leaders in any of the capacities I just mentioned, uh, because the scriptures envision the leaders of God's people as, as, as men and women who are men and women of the word, who know the word of God and who seek to live out the word of God and who are capable of communicating the word of God to others. And that communication can take place in a formal setting, a classroom, or from a pulpit in a worship service. But it can also take place in much more informal ways, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation, a phone conversation, even an email uh, or a Facebook post, right? How we handle scripture in those um, those communication settings and contexts is very important. And um, so Keith and I are both just passionate about uh, the scriptures, the study of the scriptures, teaching the scriptures. And um, we've benefited from the, the counsel and guidance of many, prof many professors and many pastors who have schooled us in being students of the word. And we just want to share some of what we've, what we've learned and what is beneficial to us. In, in, in our in our ministry leadership. So um, Keith, it seems to me that the place to start uh, is with this idea that ministry leaders need to be people who 
um, read, I, 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 the way I've termed it is read widely mm -hmm. in, in the scriptures. So maybe you can um, explain what that means. Uh, maybe give us some insight on how you do that, mm -hmm. why it's important. So I think there is a temptation when we read scripture to just read it in absolute isolation. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, I'm going to sit down today and I'm going to read John chapter three. And that's the only thing I'm going to read. I'm going to read John chapter three. Very famous story with a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Uh, it's where, you know, probably the most famous verse of the Bible comes from, John 3, 16. Um, but if we only read that chapter, only read that story, uh, we're not getting the whole picture because there's stuff that came before it. There's stuff that comes after it. There's context of what's going on in Israel, who Nicodemus is, what Jesus is there to do. Uh, and if you don't understand or don't know about the rest of the story, that one piece uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, I'm using this example because I actually, I just preached this uh, pretty recently. Nicodemus shows up two more times in the Gospel of John. Uh, the first time he shows up is there in John 3, where he comes to Jesus, he asks his question about, you know, what do I have to do? Uh, and Jesus tells him, you have to be born again. Nicodemus is very confused. Uh, and as far as we know, he just walks away after that conversation. He shows up again in John chapter 7, where he is he's trying to straddle the fence, uh, so to speak. Jesus has become more popular. He's become more problematic. The religious leaders are uh, considering having him arrested. Uh, they are convinced that nobody who is intelligent, nobody who is well-trained or well-informed is going to have anything to do with him. Uh, and they basically just want to get rid of him. And Nicodemus stands up at that point. He is one of the religious leaders. He's one of the Sanhedrin. And he says, you know, our law doesn't allow us to just be a lynch mob. You know, he, he deserves a fair trial. Uh, so he doesn't come out and say that he's a follower of Jesus, uh, but he does stand up on his behalf. So he's, he's trying to straddle the fence there a little bit. Uh, and then at the end of John's gospel, he shows up after Jesus has been crucified, after he has died, uh, and he provides the um, alms and things for burial while Joseph of Arimathea provides the tomb. And uh, he's actually willing to step out in faith at a time when even Jesus's closest disciples are running away, uh, trying to distance themselves from ever having been a part of it. So Nicodemus takes this journey from asking a question, not knowing how to respond to trying to step out on faith, but still trying to hold back to actually just you know, making a proclamation. I'm one of this guy's followers. But if you don't read that whole story, um, John 3 loses a lot of its meaning. And this is true of anything in scripture. Uh, we have to read the Bible in context. We have to know a little bit more about what's going on in any given passage that we're reading, why it's there, what its purpose is, what its purpose was for the people it was first written to uh, in order to have a, a better understanding of what it means for us today. Yeah, it's an excellent example. And um, so when we think about, about reading widely, um, this issue of what Keith has described for us as context is extremely important. There are different levels and layers of context, mm -hmm. but uh, the, 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 one of the most important contexts for any event or saying in the Gospel of John is the entire Gospel of John itself, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, one application of reading widely is to read the Gospel of John from beginning to end, right? So to, to read entire biblical books and to take in their whole um, structure and message is one application of reading widely. Another is uh, to read the Bible forward, right? That is from beginning to end, mm -hmm. right? The, Church leaders, ministry leaders do need to have a, a strong handle on the overarching biblical story from Genesis to Revelation. Um, and I'm, I'm not necessarily advocating, uh, you know, follow a read through the Bible in a year program. That's, that's not necessarily what I'm advocating. I'm not so sure that the timeline is as important as um, 
as 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 the work itself, right? Of uh, taking in the entire biblical story, and it is work uh, because you know the Bible is a collection of 60, 66 books uh, that uh, are, are in many ways very different from one another, and some. I suppose are a little bit more challenging to make it all the way through than others. A lot of people, if they are trying to read the Bible from beginning to end, get bogged down in Leviticus or Numbers, something like that. Right. Um, but they, it, it, it's, it's just crucial to, um, to read the Bible forward from beginning to end uh, to, to gain a handle on that overarching uh, biblical story within which the individual books of the Bible, you know, have their meaning and message. Right. And this isn't to say that, you know, if you're a lay leader in a church, you know, you're a Sunday school teacher or you're a board member or something like that, that you have to suddenly become an expert on no. Bible theology. Uh, no. This is, this is really just a question of familiarity. Yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I preached one time on a story from the book of Judges. I think I was preaching on Ehud. Ehud is one of my favorite characters just for the <laughs> sheer absurdity of his story. Um, but, but after I, I preached that, I had an elder in the church come up to me and say, you know, that was really neat. I have never heard that story before. Hmm. You are an elder of the church and you haven't heard of a story that's in the Bible. Not that he hadn't heard my interpretation or my explanation. He had never heard that that even existed. That, that's, Sorry, a, yeah. that's a red flag there. It uh, is a red flag. If you're going to lead, uh, if you're going to teach, uh, you have to be familiar with what you're, you're teaching and leading. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so we encourage, uh, we encourage ministry leaders to, to read widely, uh, read the Bible forward, Read it from beginning to end. Uh, when you're reading, uh, you know, read through entire biblical books. Some biblical books are small enough to be read through in one setting. Mm -hmm. Right, many of the letters of Paul and some of the other letters in the New Testament, some of the minor prophets, uh, the book of Ruth, the book of Esther, the book of Daniel, uh, small enough to be to be read through in one setting. Others require, you know, more sustained exposure. Um, but yeah, th this is this is I think you know, a, a really important piece of the puzzle, and I want to and, and so this is also an encouragement uh, not to if you're a ministry leader especially we encourage you do not limit your Bible reading to the use of like a daily devotional mm -hmm. right because a daily devotional tends to not even take like an entire biblical chapter like John three like he was talking about but maybe take two or three verses out of John 3 and then provide a meditation based on those three verses, right? right? That in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. The problem is if your Bible reading is limited to that, you know, my Bible reading is I sit down and I, I read this daily day, day devotional each day. It takes me five minutes. I get two or three verses of scripture. So my then I'm just reading these isolated little snippets, right? right? And I never gain a, a sense of how the biblical books hang together and the overarching biblical story. Right. So you can use those, but but it should only be a small part of your those devotionals. I mean, but it should only be a small part of your, you know, your scripture diet, so to speak. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I have tried to emphasize in my ministry is that I don't want people to take my word for it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's my job to teach, yes, but uh, I could make mistakes. I'm not a perfect person. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want somebody to just take what I say and automatically assume that every single word that comes out of my mouth is identical to what God has said. Right. And, and we need to take that approach and apply it to everything else. Mm -hmm. And so like you're talking about with daily devotionals. They are fantastic resources to provide encouragement to, you know, especially if you're reading them <clears throat> like the first thing in the morning to kind of give you a boost for the day. Uh, they're they're excellent for that, but that is you know whoever wrote that that's their interpretation. That's you know what they have felt uh, they want to read or they want to teach or whatever, and, and you need to take that approach of 
you know, just because this person said it and just because it's been published, that doesn't mean that it's inherently accurate, even if they are quoting a, a Bible verse or two to give their point. Uh, it's still wise to say, all right, let's go and look at how this fit into its original context. Let's see what else was going on in that uh, story beyond just uh, these two or three verses. And, and we need to do that with everything. We need to do that with our preachers, with our teachers. We need to do that with the books we read. We need to do that with you know, Facebook posts or social media posts that are made. Um, just yes. wise practice in general, it reading is. widely. Yeah, a necessary part of accountability within the church is, is exactly what he was talking about. So uh, we're talking about habits for Bible study for ministry leaders. Mm -hmm. And our first recommendation is read widely. Our second recommendation is study deeply. So this is, uh, this second recommendation is moving to another level of intensity, a deeper level of, of labor. Um, so as Keith said, we are not saying that every elder or deacon or Bible school teacher needs to be a Bible scholar. That's not what we're saying. But especially if you have a, a responsibility for leading as an elder or for teaching as a, as a Bible school teacher, or small group leader, if you have some of those responsibilities, yeah, we believe it's important to have at least a basic familiarity with the skills uh, for, for, bi for biblical interpretation, a basic familiarity with some of the most important tools for biblical interpretation and to actually spend some time doing this uh, as, as a personal spiritual discipline, uh, to spend some time not just reading a book uh, 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 in the Bible, but doing the work necessary to understand it. And so, um, Keith, what are your what 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 are your um, first pieces of advice in this regard? I well, the first thing to say is. You know, somebody might be listening to this and wondering, you know, why they should take this approach. Mm -hmm. I think the answer to that is that scripture itself commands it. Um, you know, James talks about how, you know, not many should become teachers because they're going to be held to a higher standard um, for that, by that which we, we teach. Jesus says, you know, if you cause somebody to stumble uh, by the things that you say or do, you would have been better off to have a, a millstone tied around your neck and be thrown into a, a lake um, than to do that. And scripture takes the act of teaching very, very seriously uh, in any context. Then. So that would be preachers, that would be Sunday school teachers, that would be people who are just sharing something, sharing a part of the gospel, sharing their witness or their testimony. It takes it very seriously. Uh, it God wants us to share what we know with the world. I mean, that's how people become Christians, is existing Christians share what they know. Um, but he also wants us to do that in a way that honors him, in a way that is faithful to what he has said. Uh, and unfortunately, when we don't do that, we end up oftentimes causing more problems. Uh, which, I, I, you can look around the world and see that. You know, how many different denominations or even cults started because somebody decided to twist something in scripture to make it mean what they wanted it to mean. And so if you're going to be a ministry leader in any capacity and you're going to be teaching in any capacity, um, you need to be aware that this isn't something to take lightly. Uh, this is the most serious thing you could be doing. Uh, it's an, a worthy thing to do. It's an excellent thing to do, but it is a serious thing to do. Uh, and so we have to be faithful with what God has entrusted to us in his word. And that means knowing it, uh, knowing it well enough to know um, how to handle it appropriately. Yeah. As uh, that well-known passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2 talks about, right, Keith, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to do your best to present yourself as a workman approved, you know, who rightly or accurately handles the word of truth. And so building on what, what Keith has said, we want to make clear that there is a distinction between uh, reading and studying the Bible. They're, they're not the same things. Um, 
reading, of course, is a prerequisite to studying. It's a necessary part of it. Right. Uh, but there, but there's also a lot more to it than there than there is simply reading it like you would read a novel or a comic book or something. Right. There's there, there's a lot more to it. And this is Keith and I are not going to turn this into a seminar on biblical interpretation. That's not what that's not what our our purpose is here. Um, so the first thing that you, uh, well, I don't know if it's the first thing or not, but let me just talk about a few Bible study tools mm -hmm. that are that are, are helpful to have. Um, first of all, I, I think it's wise for, uh, for ministry leaders to utilize two or three different English translations right. of, of the Bible to compare and contrast the, diff the differences between the translations. Uh, a good tool for that, you can get a parallel Bible. Uh, a parallel Bible has um, usually four, sometimes more different English translations of the Bible set side by side so that you can read, you know, all of, as an example, all of Psalm 23 in one column, it's the King James, and in the next column, it's the NIV, and in the next column, it's the New American Standard, and in the next column, it's the you know New Revised Standard or something, right? And you can read how each of those English translations translates mm -hmm. and renders Psalm 23. Uh, that that's an important tool. Comment, Keith, on why a, a parallel Bible or, or having a, two or three different English translations is an important part of Bible study. So one of the things about just the Bible in general is you know it was written. A very long time ago, and it was written in different languages. Uh, the New Testament's written in Greek, the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. There are pieces of both that are written in Aramaic. Uh, all three of those languages are very, very different from the English language, uh, and of course, have been separated by 2,000 years of time. Um, and so, necessarily, what happens when we translate from those ancient texts into contemporary English? is that the translators have to make decisions. Now, this word means five different things. Mm, there is no English word that means that same five different things. So we're gonna have to, all right, we'll translate in this one, but we lo lost the other four along the way. Um, but a different translator will say, ah, I don't like that one, I want that one. Uh, and so if you are comparing several different translations, you can start seeing where there are some differences um, not that the text means something different, but that the translators have made different decisions on how to translate and interpret uh, some of those words and some of those meanings along the way. Uh, in some of our previous episodes, we, we talked a little bit about just the history of translating from uh, the ancient sources into English. And so uh, you're welcome to go back and watch some of those uh, episodes where we've talked about that in more detail. Um, but it's something that we have to be aware of. There is no English translation that it is an exact one-to-one -to, -one to um, what the original Hebrew and Greek was because our language does not have an exact one-to-one. -one. Uh, and so if you're only reading in whatever your favorite translation is, whether that's King James, NIV, New American Standard, whatever, uh, you're only seeing a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, so... You know, I'm preparing to preach this week, this coming Sunday from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And there are some good examples just in those two verses of areas where uh, translators have to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And so in my sermon preparation, I created my own little parallel Bible using my Bible software. And I set six different English translations of those two verses side by side so that I could compare and contrast how, the, uh, you know, how those English translators handle, handle the, the text. So um, just the familiarity, if nothing else, the familiarity with the, the, with the, the choices mm -hmm. that um, English translators make uh, gives you a greater level of familiarity with the biblical text itself, right? Um, so we, 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 go ahead, Keith. I think also it gives you a familiarity with your, the people you are teaching. That's true um, because not everybody's reading from the same Bible translation. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, just in, I'm just using the, our congregation as an example. I know there are a couple of people that are 
uh, very partial to the King James Version. And so, you know, that's really the only thing they're going to read. I know somebody that uses the uh, Christian Standard Bible, uh, which is a, a much newer translation. Um, there are some that use the NIV. Uh, there are some that use the New American Standard the way I do. Um, there are some that will use the NLT, which is uh, on a very different side of the spectrum. Uh, and so, you know, whenever I'm preaching, I have people in the congregation who are, if they're reading along in their Bibles, you know, there's five, six, seven different translations. Uh, yeah. And I've had people mention this before, you know, I was thrown off because I was reading this and what was up on the screen or what you were reading was very different than what I was right. reading. And it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Well, that happens because yeah. there were, there's more than one way to, to translate that. Yeah. So uh, some other resources that we recommend that ministry leaders have, these are the basic, if you think of a toolbox, right. And if you're, if you're a handyman and you have your, you have your cordless drill and you have your hammer and your nails and your screwdrivers and your wrenches in your toolbox, right? These, these resources that Keith and I are talking about are the basic tools in the Bible, the Bible interpreter's toolbox. Um, a, a, a few different English translations is one. Mm -hmm. uh, a second is a good Bible dictionary. Um, a Bible dictionary, this is where uh, you're going to get a lot of information about Bible backgrounds, um, and, and there, are, there are multiple different Bible dictionaries that are available. Some of them are one volume uh, Bible dictionaries, and there are also multi-volume sets of, of Bible dictionaries or Bible encyclopedias, um, such that if you're reading uh, a gospel passage and Keith referenced the Sanhedrin earlier, you don't know what the Sanhedrin is, you can look up in your Bible dictionary or encyclopedia, and there will be an article about the Sanhedrin, right? Or you can look up a, in, in your Bible dictionary about the Gospel of John, and there will be an article about the Gospel of John, uh, theories about who wrote it, when it was written, why it was written, what the structure of the Gospel of John is, uh, what its theological themes are, things such as these, um, and on and on and on it goes. Um, Bible dictionaries provide some really essential knowledge uh, for, in terms of biblical backgrounds uh, that, that are just really, really crucial. They, you know, they're not going to tell you everything, but that are at least going to give you a handle on many of the basic uh, historical, cultural, literary issues. And the other benefit there is there are a lot of words used in scripture in a unique way you know, when it's used in scripture. Uh, this is actually our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, I call it manna. Manna means, what is it? Uh, and so, you know, <laughs> okay. we're asking the question, what is it? Of what is it? That's great, Keith. Words and, and right. topics and things. Um, but one of the ones that we did recently is the word love. Mm. In English, I can say, I love my mom and I love pizza and I love my church family, and I love, you know, going to the movies, and I hopefully mean very different things uh, on each of those. Mm -hmm. um, but in Greek, uh, there are four different words for love, and I'm not going to dive into all that right now, but um, just that word love, it means something different in scripture than what we often mean when we use the word love. And so if you look that up in a Bible dictionary, um, you're going to get that information, you know, here is, you know, what this kind of word means, or, you know, here are the options. Uh, so even words that you think you know the definition to, uh, it would be beneficial to look them up in a Bible dictionary just to get some context of how that word is used in a scriptural context uh, versus how we would use it today. Yeah, absolutely. And a companion to a good Bible dictionary or Bible encyclopedia is a good study Bible. Mm -hmm. um, a study Bible is kind of a combination between a Bible dictionary or Bible encyclopedia and a Bible commentary. It's kind of an amalgamation of those two things. Uh, a good study Bible is going to provide um, some articles that provide, provide information about historical and cultural backgrounds. Uh, most study Bibles have 
introductory articles to each of the biblical books that cover issues like authorship and date and you know structure. Um, and then also study Bibles provide a study notes, basically a running commentary uh, with some interpretation and explanation of the text. And as Keith said earlier, um, just because uh, a, some, a, you know, a Bible scholar or pastor has written a commentary that shows up in a study Bible doesn't necessarily mean that that interpretation or explanation of the text is right. Um, but so it should be looked at critically uh, and evaluated, but it should also, but we should also recognize that the people who are generally speaking, who are writing those study notes are people who've done their homework and they, they have some important information and perspective to, to share with us. And, and we can learn from, from those, from those commentary notes. And so, um, a, a good study Bible is, uh, is, is an essential piece of the puzzle also. And oftentimes, you know, if you're looking for sort of like a hybrid between, you know, doing daily devotions out of something simple like an actual daily devotional uh, or doing your serious, all right, I'm sitting down and I'm planning out what I'm going to be teaching or, or preaching or uh, things like that. A study Bible is a good middle of the road between those two, uh, where you can read scripture in its context and you can get the short running commentary along the way so you don't have to, all right, I don't know what this means. Let me go pull out this book and turn to what and now, now I'm going to come back over here. It's all right there on one page for you. Uh, and so in that sense, it's a, a good good way to get more information and get it in an easy to use uh, format. Uh, and then um, perhaps some of that then prompts some of the more more serious study, like, oh, this commentary in my study Bible said this, um, but I'm still confused, or I want more information about it, or I'm thinking I want to teach it, so now I'm going to use that as my starting point and go do some more serious study out of something else. Um, but it's, it's a good way to kind of bridge the gap between the two. Right, absolutely. So, um... Just to reiterate our list here, uh, we think it's important to have in your toolbox. Um, uh, oh, what did I say? Oh yeah, uh, two or three at least English translations of the Bible, uh, a Bible dictionary or, or encyclopedia, a study Bible. Uh, we would also list a, a concordance here. Uh, a concordance is basically a catalog of biblical words. Right. And uh, so Keith was talking about the word love. If you have a concordance, you can look up um, every time that the word love is used in the Bible, or at least every time that Hebrew or Greek words are translated into English as love right. uh, in, in the Bible. And you, you, what you'll find if you concentrate on that word is there's a lot of them, right? <laughs> there, 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 there's a lot of them. So, I can, uh, and you could do the same thing with anger. You could do the same thing with trust or faith or judgment, whatever the, the, the particular word may be. So a concordance is a way to gain uh, exposure to how the biblical words are used throughout the Bible. As Keith said, the word love means something quite different in the Bible than we often mean by it when we use it in contemporary English. And so seeing how the word is love is used across the biblical books and the biblical contexts can be very, very, very informative. Um, a, a, the concordances will also usually have a numbering system and a glossary at the back of the concordance. The numbering system is in the catalog. And so it, let's, you know, if you look up the word love in John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world. I think that's, well, that's one of the specific Greek words for love. And next to that listing of that word in that verse, in the concordance, there will be a number, which indicates which Greek word has been translated as love in John 3, 16. And then you can look up in the back of the concordance in the glossary, uh, a, a brief 
definition of that word. Um, and so it provides it provides you a little bit of insight into the the, the meaning of the original biblical terms. Um, so and and learning to see the, in the details how the biblical words are used is really one of the keys to, to good Bible study. There are also some probably some caveats that we need to provide with this. I don't know if that's what you're thinking of, Keith, but uh, yeah, what are the what are those caveats that, that you would think of in your other uh, counsel on using a concordance? Well, one is that um, you're still probably only going to get a piece of the puzzle. Um, mm -hmm. so let's let's stay with the love analogy here for a moment. If I look up love in John three sixteen, it's going to give me a reference for the word agape, mm -hmm. uh, which is used a lot in the New Testament. It's the, probably the primary um, version of love that's used in the New Testament. So if I look up the word, or if I look up the number for agape, and then look up every word, every time that word appears in Scripture, I'm going to get a lot of information, a lot of good information. I'm not going to get every time the word love appears because there are, well, there's two other uh, major words uh, in Greek that are also translated as love. Uh, and so I'm going to miss those if I only see the agape ones and not the phileo and the storge ones. Um, so you're still going to have to do a little bit of digging if you want the full entire picture. This is just a, another good starting point or another good tool along the, the journey. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, this is more so when we're using looking at the Old Testament than the New Testament uh, is that just because one writer in one particular time uses a word one way, uh, that doesn't mean that that's the way it, what it means every single other time it appears. Right. And so some people, I think, get thrown off by the fact that translators will translate one word five different ways uh, yeah. across the Bible. Uh, but in a very real sense, you know, what that word meant for Moses may mean something very different than what it means for Isaiah writing 700 years later, uh, or what it means for David, or what it means for Malachi, you know, because they're in a different context, they're in a different uh, point of history. I mean, just look at the English language, uh, how many words have vast different meanings now than they did during the time of William Shakespeare or during the, the time of the King James Bible. Uh, like words the word gay, change over like, time. Right, like the word gay, right? Mm -hmm. The word gay, you know, a couple of hundred years ago meant something very different than the way we typically use it today, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the meanings of words change over time. Uh, but even at the same time, within the same historical setting, uh, words can have more than one connotation, right, or more than one um, implication. And so it, it really is context that determines meaning. Right. You know, uh, one example here is um, the word day in Genesis chapter one, right? Um, even if it can be demonstrated that every other time that word is used in the Old Testament, it means a 24 hour day, uh, like what we're used to, that doesn't necessarily clinch that, it, that the word day in Genesis chapter one means a 24 hour period of time. Right. Uh, because it's the context of what's happening there in Genesis one that ultimately determines that meaning, not how it's used elsewhere. And so one of the cautions in using a concordance to do word studies is to import or to is to warn against importing meaning from one place to another place right just because this word means this over here in in isaiah doesn't mean that it means the same thing here in leviticus right um and a word cannot mean everything at once right um it, it can have it can have more than one connotation or implication for sure but it can't mean everything all at once um and so yes it's important to, it's, it is important to remember that uh, yeah. i will also say you know if you're listening to this conversation and you're you're starting to think to yourself this is too much this is too difficult <laughs> this isn't worth the effort uh type of thing um i will say you know it's 
we're, we're giving you a lot of cautions because yes. again, we, we think this is something that needs to be taken very seriously. Uh, yes. However, um, it's not nearly as complicated as it probably seems like when you're just, uh, it's like anything else. Uh, once you have done it a few times and once you kind of get a, a foothold on how to handle something, uh, it becomes a whole lot simpler to do. Um, and so if, you, if you're just starting out or you're, you're wondering you know, how to get involved in this, uh, I think the best recommendation I can give you is just start, just practice. Uh, maybe use somebody's guidance along the way. You know, if you have a, a mentor who can help you, uh, who can you know, guide you through some of this, or uh, if there's, uh, I mean, there are tools out there as well that, um, or books out there or you know resources out there that say you know here's kind of a way to to get started on this journey but uh, don't be afraid of it just because it seems complicated um, sometimes the complication is what makes it worth it yeah that's exactly right and a couple of good resources like kind of like how to guides to studying the bible uh, one is uh, it's a book that i cut my teeth on actually in, Bi in bible college many years ago uh, Living by the Book by Howard Hendricks is a good resource. And also a, a much newer resource is How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth yes. by Fee and Stewart. Um, if you're looking for an accessible like introduction to, okay, I, I do want to take this Bible study stuff seriously. How do I do it? Right, Both of those resources are, are good ones. And we would recommend a, a guide like that is part of the toolbox, right? Because mm -hmm. it's one thing to have the tools. It's another thing to know what to do with them, right? Um, and, and so a guide, in fact, maybe Keith, maybe one of our, maybe one of our subsequent episodes to this could be a little bit of a step-by-step, -step, like, okay, I want to study the gospel of John. Mm -hmm. um, here's the first four steps into that, right? Here's, 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 here's the how to, uh, to get started. But you know, what we want to emphasize is that some deeper level of study, um, we're not saying that you have to, if you're going to teach a 45 minute Sunday school lesson to fifth graders, that you have to spend five hours preparing for that. That's not what we're saying. Um, but, but some deeper level of study using one or two, at least of these tools um, is, is really important, both for the purpose of what Keith already said, about um, making sure that our teaching is as faithful and as accurate as possible because God takes the teaching of his word really seriously. But this deeper level of study is also important for the formation of the ministry leader, himself or herself, for, for each of us as ministry leaders to, to grow in our understanding of and relationship with God and the formation of our heart and mind to truly to truly think and speak and act uh, biblically. Yeah, I don't, I don't really think it's possible to teach something that you yourself do not know or have not experienced. Mm -hmm. And so if you as the, the teacher have only ever covered the surface level of something, and that's all your class is ever going to receive from you is just the, the surface level. So the, the deeper you dive into it yourself, the better you will be able to help others dive there with you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's 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 transition here to another aspect of, of good Bible study habits for ministry leaders. We've talked about reading widely. We've talked about studying deeply. Uh, a third component here is uh, prayer and meditation. That study of the scriptures. This was impressed on me really strongly when I was in Bible college at Great Lakes Christian College. Uh, if you're in ministry of any kind, if you're teaching in any way, it's possible for your approach to the Bible to become just about acquiring information to convey information to others. It can become kind of a dry academic approach uh, to the Bible, which is devoid of uh, a spiritual heartbeat. And that is actually a pretty dangerous place to be as, as, as a ministry leader. And so 
Um, you know, my professors really impressed that on me when I was in Bible college. And I've always, ever since those days, I've tried to prioritize that for me, uh, studying the Bible deeply is ultimately about loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving my neighbor as myself. And um, so prayer before study, reading and studying scripture, prayer while reading and studying scripture, uh, taking time to maybe in silence and stillness meditate, uh, which just means to turn a particular verse or a few words of scripture over and over in one's heart and mind. Um, earlier, I was uh, earlier this morning, I was just in some silence and some, some stillness uh, meditating on the words of Paul in Romans 8, you know, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, you know, just really thinking and praying deeply, meditating deeply about, you know, God's unbreakable love for us. And so this is an essential aspect of Bible study as well, that uh, studying God's word is not just about acquiring information, and it is not just about um, conveying information. It is about encountering God himself, this conviction that the, the word of God is living and active, that he meets us in the text, speaks to us through the text, and uses the text to form us, uh, to become more like Christ himself, to grow in our love for him and for our neighbors. And as Keith was just saying about you can't teach something unless you know it, uh, the same thing is true in, in, the, in, the, in the spiritual life that you can't you, you can't teach about experiencing God if you are not personally experiencing God, right? And, and those who receive our teaching uh, over time will be able to tell the difference between someone who is just interested in acquiring and conveying information and someone who through the scriptures is encountering and growing in love for God. I think there's a tendency to view a dichotomy here that there are those who uh, job or calling is to simply teach you know the same way that you know somebody in the school system their job is to teach a subject uh, and to convey yeah. that information so that you know their students can uh, get a good test score and then move on and you know, we'll, we'll never see them or talk to them again or anything like that uh, and then there are those whose job is to, or their calling is to preach. Uh, and by that, we often in this context mean, you know, to elicit an emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, a lot of times uh, the people on this side are, are very dry and rigid and strict, while the people on this side are very, you know, in your face, shouting, carrying on, uh, fire and brimstone type of thing. And the reality should be that there isn't a distinction here. The person who is called to teach is also the person who is called to preach. Um, that we convey information, yes, but we do so to elicit a response from people, uh, be that conviction to say, hey, you know, scripture says that you're not supposed to do this, and I've been doing this, and I need to stop doing this, um, whether that is, you know, salvation, you know, somebody, you know, re realizing that they need to give their lives to Christ to become uh, a committed follower of him or a more dedicated follower of him, uh, or whether that is just spiritual growth and saying, you know, I'm not completed on this journey. I may have been doing this for 70 years, but I'm still breathing. So that means I still have more to learn, more to do along the way. Um, but you, you can't really separate those two things. They have to go together uh, because that's what scripture intends for them to do is to go together. And prayer and meditation is the primary way that we do that within ourselves to make sure that uh, our teaching is more than just teaching the information. Right. And, and good Bible study, you know, the kind that Keith and I have been trying to describe, is the way that preaching does not degenerate into shallow emotionalism, right? Right. Where I'm just manipulating your emotions mm -hmm. with my rhetorical flair or my own you know, body language and, you know, all of that stuff, because a, a talented public speaker can do that, right? He can, 
you know, manipulate your emotions without offering you much of anything in the way of substance. Right. Right. And so, again, as Keith has said, there isn't a division here. Uh, the, the, the Bible content, the, uh, the knowledge of truth and facts and implications from the word of God, it needs to be married to uh, this deep love of God, which does legitimately um, inform and affect our emotions and our, and our desires. The two really go hand in hand. Okay. And so, if you're a if you're a ministry leader and you have a responsibility for communicating the word of God in some way, um, what that presumes is that you know God personally, right? And you're walking with Him, and that the Bible study and teaching that you're doing is part and parcel of knowing Him and walking with Him. So, um, anything else to say on that on that topic, Keith? Well, I just think that. It'll be evident, you know, I have had teachers in various capacities where, you know, it's obvious to me at least that, uh, I don't know how I want to word this, that it has just become sort of an academic thing for them. You know, whether that is that they've been doing it forever and so it's boring to them or uh, their heart really isn't in it. They're just doing it because they feel obligated to do it. Um, the The result is the same. You know, there there is definitely something lacking there. Um, conversely, I've had quite a few teachers and preachers who, you know, it's evident that they love God. They have that intimacy with Him. Uh, they're doing this out of a passion and a desire to you know, share what they have with others. Um, and I think you know, God honors that. You know, if something is there that we're struggling with, but we're sincerely trying to do what is best and we're open to doing what is best, you know, I, I think he's going to help us along the way. Yeah. So Amen. again, if, if, you're, if you're afraid uh, of what we've been talking about and just overwhelmed by it all, um, the answer is to let God lead. Yeah. Amen. Again, you know, prayer and meditation is how we do that. Um, right. but, but let the Holy Spirit guide you in your study as well as in your presentation of, of what you have studied. Uh, I mean, he has a very vested interest in making sure that what he has said gets communicated accurately. So if we let okay. him, uh, he's going to, to help us do that. Amen. That's, that's absolutely true. Uh, he's the author of it. So yeah, he, he, he wants us to be, to be faithful vessels, faithful messengers. And yes, we've given you a lot of information. And as Keith has said, it could kind of seem intimidating. But another way to think about this is it's, a, it's really a great adventure. Um, studying the Bible is it's thrilling. It's exciting. Sometimes it's a little terrifying, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, you know, it's always challenging and always interesting. There's so much to learn. And the greatest students of scripture in history have dedicated their lives to studying it. Uh, all of them, I have no doubt, get to the end, get to the end of life and say, if only I had more time, or right? there's so much more to learn and explore. And so it's like going into a, you know, a vast cave system uh, that you'll never get to the last cavern. You'll never get to the last storehouse of treasures mm -hmm. uh, there'll be so much left unexplored and that i mean that's just an invitation right like there's so much to learn and grow in what god has revealed to us um and you'll never even make it to the first cavern unless you get started right mm -hmm. uh, somehow some way and so you know keith and i are passionate about and both of us are in ministry largely because of our love for the word of god mm -hmm. and uh, our desire to communicate it to others and we just want to encourage other ministry leaders to share that same passion and that commitment to being good students of the word. Um, Keith, do you have any final suggestions, recommendations uh, for, for the folks who are joining us in this conversation? Yeah, so um, just really briefly, going back to the various resources we mentioned earlier, um, if you're looking for that, you know, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm interested in acquiring some of these. I, I'm interested in starting this process. Uh, there are a couple of good places to start. 
Uh, one is online. Um, a lot of concordances, dictionaries, that kind of stuff, are they are available online. Um, Blueletterbible.org, Bible Gateway, I think they're also .org, Study Light. Um, they're all free resources that have a lot of those things embedded into them. Uh, it might take a little, there's a bit of a learning curve there of figuring out, all right, how do I access some of this information? Um, but that those are all good and easy ways to um, get a lot of that uh, without any cost uh, to you. Um, a lot of physical libraries offer them as well. Now, our church library has some of that stuff available for people to check out. I'm sure, Buchanan's library has as well. Uh, public libraries often will have some of this uh, uh, available to people. Uh, so if you're on a budget and not sure how to access this stuff and you're not really sure how to handle the uh, online part of it, uh, check with your church or check with the local library. Uh, they should be able to help you uh, find some of it as well. Yeah. But then other than that, um, Strong's is the probably the most popular in the concordance, Strong's Concordance. Um, Vine's Dictionary, I think, is probably the most popular uh, Bible dictionary. Um, trying to think what of the other ones are the major ones that are relatively easy to find. Right. Baker has a series of resources there that's the, the Baker Illustrated Bible Dictionary, and I think the Baker Illustrated Bible Handbook. Mm -hmm. Haley's Bible Handbook. Haley's Bible Handbook. Erdman's has a single volume Bible dictionary and a single volume Bible handbook. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, all the major English translations have study Bibles. Right. American Standard, the NIV, the ESV, the New Living Translation, and so on. They all have, they all have study Bibles that you can turn to. Uh, yeah, and I think Strong's you know, I think Strong's is, you can find a New American Standard Strong's and NIV Strong's, right? Whatever translation you, I guess, prefer, you can find a concordance right. that, that uses that translation. So, yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the online resources. <laughs> you know, when Keith, well, I, I probably Keith, even when you were in Bible college, not as much of that stuff was available online as it is now. You know, when I was in Bible college, you know, it was when the Bible software stuff was in online stuff was really just getting its start. Mm -hmm. And so much, there really wasn't much at all that was available online and certainly not for free. And so, you know, we spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on the print stuff. Right. Um, which which is great. And Keith and I love that. We love that stuff. But it is quite expensive. Right. Um, and so now that there are so many free Internet resources, if you're. You know, if you're an internet user, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and uh, if you have questions on that, either one of us are, are more than willing to help you find uh, resources. Or uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say most every pastor is also, you know, if you go to them and say, hey, I want to know more about the Bible and how to, to study it, they're probably going to say, all right, I'll, I'll help you with that. Right. I mean, that's, that's what our, our career right like, yes <laughs> right yes right. and that Not reminds me right that reminds me something i wanted to say uh about the like the bible dictionaries encyclopedias and study bibles uh, as well as an introduction to how to study the bible like you know the book how to study the bible for all its worth those one really important aspect of bible study that we didn't really touch on but I do want to mention here as we wrap up is understanding the differences between the diff the different the various kinds of literature in the Bible, mm -hmm. right? So there are, there is history, there is poetry, there is law, there are sermons, there are parables, and there are you know on and on and on it goes. And um, I was just having this conversation with a member here at BCC just the other day asking me about how to discern the difference between a something that should be read quote unquote literally and something that should be understood as a metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. And a large part of the answer to that question is, well, what kind of literature are you reading, right? Are, are you reading law or poetry or history, right? 
that doesn't answer the whole question, but that's a that's a really important place to start. Right. And so, um, and these tools that Keith and I have described, if they're good tools, they will give at least an introductory guide to how to understand the different kinds of literature that we find in the Bible. Right. And I think, you know, this is this is true in life in general. You know, if I'm reading a, a Shakespearean play, I know that that's not an actual historical event. It's a story that has a, you know, maybe a moral to teach, or maybe it's just meant for entertainment. Uh, versus if I pull off a, a book book from the shelf that says, you know, a history of World War II, well, mm -hmm. I know that that's intended to give me factual, concrete details of, of things that happened. What happens in scripture is you know, there isn't a title that says, all right, this is <laughs> history, this is poetry. Uh, right. so, so we have to just understand that, you know, if we're reading the book of Exodus, you know, that is uh, an historical account of something that happened and all of the details that went into uh, that taking place versus if we're reading the Proverbs, you know, this is a collection of uh, old wisdom sayings and ideas for how to live life in a sort of a pragmatic sense, uh, but it's not to be taken as literally uh, as the Exodus uh, is, because that's not what that purpose is. Just as sure. Shakespeare's play is not meant to be taken the same way that the book of history is meant to be. Sure. Exactly. And that doesn't mean that one is right or wrong, or that you know one is you know, no longer valid, or you know things like that. Just the, again, we have to be aware of the context. We have to be aware of what it is we're reading in order to be able to interpret and apply it the right way. Yep, exactly. So Keith and I have really enjoyed this uh, conversation. We hope it's been beneficial to you as we encourage ministry leaders to have good Bible study habits. Perhaps there's something that we've not covered, something we've said that you have a question about, um, or something you'd like more information on, and we welcome your input and your questions. Uh, let us know. Uh, whether we can respond to that perhaps in the comments or perhaps in subsequent episodes of uh, Small Town Pastors. Absolutely. Uh, probably still going to be a bit slow going uh, as we get it back up and running, um, but we're looking forward to having more of these conversations with you and with one another uh, in the future.